Batman nearly being crushed by a giant coin is certainly a memorable image from the Batman animated series episode Almost Got Him, a beloved and acclaimed episode wherein Batman's rogues share tales over a game of poker about the closest they each came to killing Batman. Nobody's come closer to snuffing the Batman than me. Two-Face is appropriately and deliberately positioned as the second story in the episode. He details the time he nearly took out Batman with a giant penny. This idea actually comes from an early Silver Age Batman story, Batman 81 from the year 1954. The story was called Two-Face Strikes Again, and it's also a significant Two-Face issue for how it's positioned canonically in regards to Earth 2 versus Earth 1 Two-Face. So it tends to get reprinted a decent amount. It's happened many times over the decades. It was even included in Two-Face's 75-year celebration. But just what was taken from that story that informs this episode. I thought it'd be interesting to take a look together. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and let's take a look what was pulled from this classic comic for this classic episode. Two-Face Strikes Again was written by David Verne Reed, with pencils by Dick Sprang and inks by Charles Paris. The issue Batman 81 we've looked at briefly on this channel before because of the second story, The Boy Wonder Confesses, which had Mr. Camera in it, and we were taking a look at the history of Mr. Camera. This first and more well-known story opens with a tragedy. The first Two-Face from the Golden Age Earth had undergone gone plastic surgery to repair his face and it had worked out. He'd left a life of crime behind. They detail in Superman Family 211 years later in the Bronze Age that he never went back to a life of crime. They also call him Harvey Kent because for a period of time that was Two-Face's last name before it was changed to Dent. So that detail confirms that in that timeline he was never re-injured. But this story opens with him getting hurt again, which places this as an early Earth-1 tale for the Harvey Dent Two-Face. Meaning that he got plastic surgery and then it didn't work out. It's a rough time to be Earth-1 Two-Face. Just when he thought he was out, they pulled him back in. Look, dear, that man passing us, that's Harvey Dent, the lawyer. The man once known as Two-Face. Funny, I was just reading his strange story in this magazine. How's that for a coincidence? I buy a magazine with Two-Face's story in it, and a moment later he comes walking by in the flesh. The strange career of Two-Face. Harvey Dent with his face restored by plastic surgery. Harvey Dent as he looked after the accident, which turned him into Two-Face, the desperate criminal. Did they need to add the adjective desperate? Was that necessary? Yes, Harvey Dent in the flesh, and completely unaware of the twist of fate that lies waiting for him just minutes away. Safe crackers at work. There was a time when I was Two-Face that I would pass a thing like this right by. But no, as a law-abiding citizen, I must act. You could call the police. That is another way to act as a law-abiding citizen, even in Gotham. But no, he goes in and there's an explosion and it perfectly undoes all the plastic surgery. Once more, he is Two-Face. And now it becomes clear that more than Dent's face has been re-injured. The scar reaches right through to its brain. This settles it. This proves I was meant to be a criminal. Fate has decreed it. My doctor warned me against any future accidents. Said plastic surgery couldn't be performed a second time. For reasons, I'm doomed to look this way for the rest of my life. No, the doctor told me to avoid life-altering, phase-altering explosions. The phrasing the scars reads right through to his brain is quite the visceral image. But before he goes back to a life of crime, as fate decreed, he must consult his coin. And it lands evil side up, so it's go time. And then Two-Face goes on a crime spree, committing a series of bizarre crimes, like holding up a circus clown. But the scarred criminal does not attack the box office as expected. Instead, he barges into the dressing room of Tarando, world-famous clown. Ah, Tarando the clown, known to keep a famous diamond stick pin collection in his dressing room. I'll just take them if you don't mind. Tarando must be doing great if he's got a diamond stick pin collection. In the next moment... So you're Charles Ford, the millionaire deep sea diver. Ah, and there are the gems from the many buried treasures you found in the ocean bottom. That phrasing. A nice haul, eh? <laughs> Who face hope? I kind of want to know more about Charles Ford, millionaire deep sea diver. Also, Two Face robs an actor playing Abraham Lincoln. So that's three crimes, which is off brand. And that's meant to be a bit of a mystery here. What is the two motif? That's Two Face's thing, it's his calling card. How are these twos? They even toss that at the reader, kind of make it a bit of a challenge. No, Dick, I've got it. I found the thread that binds these three crimes together. How about you? Are you as clever as the great Batman? Have you caught on to Two Face's scheme? So have you? A clown, a deep sea diving millionaire, and an actor. It feels like one of those Grables episodes, if you're familiar with those from Adventure Time, where the answer would be something outlandish that you may not have been thinking of, but it kind of makes sense. This one makes a bit more sense than that, but you do have to perform some reaching. Are you ready? You see, the thing is, each of these people had two faces. Shortly afterwards, in the Batcave crime lab, 
You see, Dick, all of Two-Face's latest victims had one thing in common, in a sense. They too were men with two faces. Of course, so that's Two-Face's newest wrinkle. He's apparently declared war on all the other Two-Faces in Gotham City. Look at how terrifyingly huge Tarando's eyes get with his clown makeup. Now that we know how Two-Face is working, it narrows the field of possible victims. That sounds like it's expanded the list, especially if you get metaphorical, which this story is going to. We all wear masks, metaphorically speaking. Meanwhile, in his hideout, the bizarre Jekyll and Hyde criminal enjoys his initial triumphs. Yes, I'm taking my revenge on all others whose lives depend on two faces. And now I'm ready to enlarge my operation by hiring a gang. If you're ready, we'll proceed with the interviewing. Revenge? Why? Nobody told you to run into that building. The interview process is fantastic. It's just him flipping the coin. I like those odds. I mean, out of all the villains in Gotham to work for, Two-Face is probably one of the better ones. It depends. Maybe not if you get into a case where it's, am I going to abandon my henchmen or not flip. He does seem open to ideas, though. Like when one of the people he hires pitches him, hey, you know who's got two faces? Batman. Of course, don't you think I knew that? The attack against Batman will be the climax of my crime wave, but first things first, our next victim will be Chicago Al Garver. Chicago Al? The big time gambler? I don't get it. Since when does he have two faces? Shortly afterwards in the Batcave, as the police radio call arrests the attention of Batman and Robin, a pedestrian reports seeing Two-Face and a car full of thugs speeding north on Gotham Point Road. That's profiling. It was the custom two-toned car, wasn't it? So as mentioned, this is where we start to get figurative, metaphorical, because the gambler has two faces in the sense that one of them is a poker face. He also has a home like a supervillain full of giant playing cards and dice, a big pool table you actually have to climb. Does the actual gambler even have a lair like this? He needs to get on that if he doesn't. You know you have too much money when. Also, you probably shouldn't decorate your house in such a way that the Joker could set up shop there. This was the first story in issue 81, so it's a decent length. The idea does start to stretch a bit, wear a bit thin, especially because they just keep repeating the same scenario. And once it's revealed what he's doing, they just play it out a couple more times. He's just harassing people with two faces somehow. So once we go through those scenarios, we have Bruce set himself up as bait, but not as Batman, as Bruce Wayne, for he too can have multiple faces. Then late that evening. Say, I just remembered the local Sioux reservation. Wants to honor Bruce Wayne for his charity work by making him an honorary chief. I've put it off, been too busy, but maybe this is a way to lure Two-Face. But I don't understand. When Bruce Wayne is drowned as chief, that officially makes him a pale face Indian. The papers are sure to play that angle up. And that gives Bruce Wayne two faces. It's a long shot, but certainly worth trying. Well, now I kind of don't want this to happen for other reasons. This issue does have some period typical phrasing and the like. Miles will vary on how that lands or bothers or rankles if it does. Batman and Robin get captured at this one. So is Bruce just a no-show again for this ceremony? The media is going to play that up too. I'm curious about what the charity was. I'll just collect it for the pile of Bruce Wayne did philanthropic things from the silver and golden ages, just archives. So with all of that done, all that's left is the climax. And that brings us to the giant penny, or in this case, not a penny, but just a giant coin. Two-Face has a big coin and he's going to tie them to it and flip them onto some giant spikes. He's also so into it, he's not going to worry about the coin. This is just a good choice all around. Don't even need to think about it. We're going to throw that to the side. The coin is launched. There's some suspense built up, but then it lands the opposite way, freeing the dynamic duo. Hitting like twin blasts of dynamite, the lawmen sail into the demoralized crooks. But how would you land good side up? It was practically an impossibility. Now practically is not a guarantee. And how'd they do it? Magnets! They weren't paying enough attention, so they're able to use something in their utility belts to magnetize and hence change the flip. The end. Now, when it comes to what was taken from this story, it was the end sequence of this koi and the flip, some of the imagery, and that's pretty much it. The episode plays out differently, although it does have some things, as mentioned, like the forklift and, of course, the giant coin, which in this case is a penny. Almost Gotham first aired November 10th of 1992. It was written by Paul Dini and directed by Eric Randomsky. Dini has stated that originally the stories were in a different order, but Random Ski reordered them so that the action would build more. I hope Two-Face was always two, as nature intended. Since the Two-Face story is but one segment in this episode, it doesn't have a long time, so they don't have time for all of the build up that the comic did. And so they keep it more succinct and stick to him doing a crime that's much more on brand in terms of not having the surprise element of, ooh, why is he twisting it up? What's changing? It's just twos and a two themed crime. It was this time I had just robbed the Gotham Mint of two million and two dollar bills. Robin is also not included in this episode 
because the episode's whole thing is them trying to kill Batman, not them trying to kill Batman and Robin. And while Robin is an integral part of the dynamic duo element, he's not necessarily pivotal to the plot of the story overall, even in the classic one. It's nice to have him there, but it's fine not having him there too. Batman is also just set to be crushed by the coin, not impaled by spikes, which would have been a bit intense. I wasn't able to find anything that said that this was a direct censorship choice, but it would make sense. Either way, it would be a horrific death, but if he was squished, you wouldn't see all those organs, no blood. Side note, this episode has some animation errors. Chief among them, Two-Face takes off Batman's utility belt. There's even a line about it. And just so you don't get any ideas. And then later on the episode, periodically Batman's wearing it, including one scene where Two-Face is holding it. Now, one of the biggest differences is how Batman escapes the penny. It's far more poetic in the episode than Magnet's. He's able to use Two-Face's own coin to get free. Where's my coin? Anybody see where I... Oh, no! This episode is also able to sell the drama a bit more with sound effects and the pacing of it. It really builds up that flip as he's hurtling towards his potential death. It's a bit more visceral than the end of the comic story. The DCAU also makes this the origin point of the Penny in the Bat Cave. They actually let him keep it. This has further fueled the idea that that's where it came from in the comics. But where it came from there is from the Penny Plunderer. And yes, it's a villain whose motif is pennies. We did a video on that. And also that inspired someone else to do a radio drama-esque redub of that story, which was amazing. I'll put a clip here and link it down below because it's very fun. When I get out, I'll get back at coppers and pennies. I'll fight coppers with pennies. Every job I pull will involve pennies. My crime symbol will be pennies. And of course, both end with Two-Face getting captured. Batman 81 and the story Two-Face Strikes Again are deemed important issues. And as mentioned, this story has been reprinted several times, so I can see those on staff being familiar with it. They did select the strongest and most visually compelling part of the issue, outside of things like the giant gambling room and one of my personal favorites of Two-Face robbing a clown. The way this episode is able to parse down this concept and apply it to its own universe is seamless. It's well done. It takes what it needs to and leaves the rest. I always find it interesting to see the points of inspiration for episodes and how much was or was not taken. Because here you have this classic Two-Face story contributing to what many would consider a classic episode. While this comic does have some moments of being of its time regarding turns of phrase, it's still a solid Two-Face story and has some of the hallmarks of the character. Delving into some of the tragic elements, like is he just doomed to be a criminal? How much has the accident jarred his mind regardless of how he looks? The scars into his brain. It also has some fun moments on its own, like him using the coin to decide how to hire people, but it also inadvertently flirts with the idea that he's just using the coin to confirm what he already wants to do, like when he chooses not to flip it before flipping Batman and Robin. These older stories are worth reading to see how the characters have evolved, how the methodology of comic storytelling has evolved, as well as the contents and how parts are used to inspire other tales. It's an interesting experience to see how these things trickle down through time and will continue to do so. I mean, this entire episode is layered levels of inspiration because the entire structure is based upon Batman issues 291 and 294 from 1970. A decent amount of inspiration for episodes from this series do come from the Bronze Age. In this case, we're looking at the arc, Where Were You on the Night Batman Was Killed? So they're condensing a lot into this one episode. So what did you think of how Almost Gotham pulled elements from Batman 81? Do you think it utilized it well? Do you think it should have pulled more or less? Are you a fan of this episode? Are you a fan of this story? Had you read it before? Had you seen it? Share all of your thoughts down below. I want to hear them. And while you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Thanks so much for taking this time to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. And I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.